The CyberWire podcast is made possible in part by listeners like you who contribute to our Patreon page. You can learn more at patreon.com slash the CyberWire. Ethiopia's government shuts down the country's internet during a period of unrest. Triton ICS malware update. The FCC moves away from net neutrality. UK warnings about cable vulnerabilities. When a keylogger isn't a keylogger. Security companies patch some products. Pyongyang likes Bitcoin. More on the nice hash Bitcoin caper. And stick them up. Your ether or your life. Time for a message from our sponsor, the good folks over at Recorded Future. You've heard of Recorded Future. They're the real-time threat intelligence company. Their patented technology continuously analyzes the entire web to give InfoSec analysts unmatched insight into emerging threats. We subscribe to and read their Cyber Daily. They do some of the heavy lifting in collection and analysis that frees you to make the best informed decisions possible for your organization. Sign up for the Cyber Daily email, and every day you'll receive the top results for trending technical indicators that are crossing the web. Cyber news, targeted industries, threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, malware, suspicious IP addresses, and much more. Subscribe today and stay ahead of the cyber attacks. Go to recordedfuture.com slash intel to subscribe for free threat intelligence updates from Recorded Future. It's timely, it's solid, and the price is right. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Friday, December 15th, 2017. Unrest and fighting in Ethiopia appear to have prompted the government to shut down most of the country's internet access. Twitter and Facebook have been out since Tuesday. Other services are affected as well. Ethiopian authorities have restricted the internet in the past, explaining it as a form of rumor control. The country's access to the Internet is relatively easy to shut down, as Ethiopia has a single Internet service provider, Ethio Telecom, which, as it happens, is also state-owned. Voice of America offers a helpful contrast. Shutting down the Internet in the United States would require the cooperation of more than 2,600 ISPs. There are other ways of reaching people, dial-up, international telephone calls, satellite phones, But the ease and familiarity of the Internet are what people have come to depend on. Investigation into the Triton attack on a Middle Eastern industrial plant continue. FireEye's Mandiant unit is working on the incident, regarded as unusually dangerous because Triton infects safety systems. A nation-state is widely suspected, with initial suspicion turning toward Iran. CyberX says the unnamed plant is located in Saudi Arabia. In the U.S., the Federal Communications Commission has canceled the net neutrality policy it had operated under. We are unsure of what the implications of this will be, beyond one implication. Cue the lawyers. A lot of litigation is expected to follow. The U.K.'s senior military officer warns that Britain's undersea cables are vulnerable to disruption. He sees them as an attractive target for Russian operators. International cables have been cut, tapped, and otherwise meddled with since the First World War, So we've got about a hundred years of proof of concept to work with here. Synaptics wants everybody to be clear. That issue with its keypad on HP laptops involved a debugger. Synaptics isn't in the keylogger business, and they'll be taking steps to remove such development tools from their products going forward. In patching news, two security companies have issued fixes for some of their products. Fortinet has patched a credential leaking flaw in its VPN client, Palo Alto Networks also has a patch out. There's for a hole in its firewall that could permit remote attacks. We've had a lot to say about Bitcoin lately, most of it in the context of bad news, so some preliminary clarification is in order. Bitcoin is used for many legitimate purposes, as well as for the dodgy ones we all too often hear about. Not only do criminals often demand ransom or other payments in Bitcoin, but pariah states have an interest in cryptocurrency as well because necessity is the mother of invention. Consider North Korea. Its finances crippled by international sanctions, the DPRK seems to be increasingly turning to Bitcoin as a source of badly needed funds. There are some signs Pyongyang may be engaged in mining Bitcoin, but they're also working on the faster payoff attainable by direct theft. 
SecureWorks has been tracking a phishing campaign in which North Korean operators circulated a job opening, CFO for a Bitcoin financial services company based in London. The company was legitimate, but the position announcement was fishbait, dreamed up in Pyongyang using a spoofed source. The goal was apparently to find people engaged in trading Bitcoin who could be induced to open a malicious document that would enable the attackers to harvest their cryptocurrency credentials and then drain their wallets. Krebs on Security has turned up an interesting fact about last week's attack on the Bitcoin mining trading platform NiceHash. The CEO of NiceHash, Matyas Yoryank, did prison time for his role in creating and selling the Butterfly botnet. He was also instrumental in founding the online forum for criminals, Darkode. He has denied to Slovenian media that he had anything to do with the disappearance of $52 million in Bitcoin from the exchange he runs. His denials were, according to Krebs, vehement, and we note that indeed he hasn't been accused of anything. And lest we think of cryptocurrency crime as being either tech-savvy, subtly socially engineered, and very white-collar, we should think again. This story arrives courtesy of the Manhattan District Attorney, whose office has announced that it's charged a guy in connection with an Ethereum robbery. One Luis Meza, a New York City resident, has been charged with arranging a stick-up to relieve one of Mr. Meza's friends of said friend's valuables. The stick-up man specifically demanded the password to the victim's Ethereum wallet. Here's how it happened. Mr. Meza invited his friend, unnamed in public documents, over to Mr. Meza's apartment for a meeting. The meeting concluded, and Mr. Meza appeared to call a car service to take his friend home. But once the friend was in the car, the driver pulled a pistol and demanded the friend's house keys, wallet, phone, and, significantly, the password to his Ethereum wallet. The DA says that the day after the kidnapping, some $1.8 million in Ether cryptocurrency turned up in Mr. Meza's personal account, the friend's digital wallet having been relieved of a comparable sum. The DA also says they have video surveillance images from the victim's apartment, showing Mr. Meza letting himself in with the victim's keys and then exiting with items associated with the victim's digital wallet. Mr. Meza, who of course is fully entitled to the presumption of innocence, says he didn't do anything. Still, the Manhattan DA seems to have enough to make this particular episode of Law & Order run for only about 20 minutes instead of the full hour, including commercials. Again, these are allegations. Anyone mentioned in connection with any alleged crime is considered innocent until proven guilty. Now I'd like to share a message from our sponsor, Nehemiah Security. Fellow cybersecurity leaders, when your CEO asks department heads for a status update, do you envy your colleagues like the VP of Sales or CFO who only have to pull a report from a single system? Instead of deploying a team of people to check multiple systems and then waiting for them to report back, do you wish you had a single place to get the information you need to communicate with the CEO? Nehemiah Security is here to put that power in the hands of the cybersecurity leader. It's time for a quick solution that allows you to go to one place to get the security information you need, quickly and in business terms your CEO can understand. Nehemiah Security gives cybersecurity leaders the ability to report cyber risk in terms of dollars and cents. Visit NehemiahSecurity.com to learn more and get a free customized demo just for CyberWire listeners. Visit NehemiahSecurity.com today. That's N-E-H-E-M-I-A-H Security.com. And we thank Nehemiah Security for sponsoring our show. Joining me once again is Emily Wilson. She's the Director of Analysis at Terbium Labs. Emily, we're going to talk today about breach fatigue. I have a lot of thoughts about this, but before I jump in, why don't you tell us what you're thinking? Is it bad to make a joke that I'm tired of this topic? Ah, ha, ha, ha. Yes. Uh, I do have thoughts. Just as someone who sees so much data all day, every day, getting leaked, you know, letting people know that there are problems, I mean... You know, we were talking earlier about uh, whether it's attacks that are impacting organizations, call it not Petia, call it WannaCry, or breaches that are impacting individuals, Equifax, or, you know, the new updated Yahoo count. Mm-hmm. The hits just keep coming. And it's been interesting to watch both as an individual uh, and as someone in this industry, people get worked up about the next new thing 
as they should, Equifax was huge. It was. There's, there's nothing else on that scale that we've seen so far. And everyone was rightly outraged and rightly concerned for a few weeks. But there are no immediate implications, whether for the individuals or for the, the parties that were you know, involved in you know, kind of letting this happen. And so what is going to be the thing that actually starts driving changes? How are we actually going to break through this? What is something that's going to you know, hold the attention of individuals or policymakers? Maybe it is Equifax. Maybe I'm being pessimistic, but I'm feeling pretty pessimistic right now. I, I agree. And I, I think there's, there's several things to unpack here. I think part of it is uh, the victims of this breach aren't going to see, may, not, may never see any results from it. They may never get affected. They may never get breached. So there's no direct correlation of Equifax got breached and now all my money is gone. It's not like a banking failure, you know, a savings and loan failure or something like that. So this sort of thing happened and it's bad. It may not. It may hit me. It may not. And if it does hit me, do I really know that it was this one that actually hit me? So the direct cause and effect isn't there where people can get really wound up and, and go to their policy people and say, you let this happen. I demand you fix it. And what happened to my money or my safety or whatever? The other thing I think is, uh, and, and I'm curious what you think about this, is um, no one goes to jail. No one goes to jail. And even it, we're seeing, you know, GDPR is going to happen uh, this coming next year. And even with GDPR, big fines. That's great. No one goes to jail. No one goes to jail. People have fines, as you mentioned, these fines toward companies. Again, let's remember, not individuals. Mm -hmm. No one goes to jail. People lose their jobs. People may be brought before Congress and asked difficult questions, but is anyone being held accountable? And actually, I mean, this is one of the conversations I was having when I was over uh, in the Netherlands recently. I was talking to people about Equifax and people were saying that they had largely been hearing about it as a huge embarrassment. And they asked me if I thought anything was going to happen to the people responsible. It's a little sad, but it was, it was phrased as a joke. It was phrased as a rhetorical question because mm. they all knew that nothing would happen. Yeah, these folks, um, they, like you say, they get they get brought in front of Congress. They get asked some difficult questions. They they suffer through it. Um, perhaps they resign. They retire early. They still get their golden parachutes. Um, so I, I think there's a general feeling that justice is not done when we have these sort of big breaches. Generally, the companies don't go out of business. So there isn't even that moral hazard of of a, of a company failure. And I think that contributes to this feeling of breach fatigue because you're just tired of hearing about some new thing that's impacting you and you never see anything come to fruition. And you, you mentioned, right, the fact that some of these people are, are going to be impacted by the Equifax breach. Some of these individuals, you know, they're going to have a problem, but they're not going to know it's Equifax. And there's, there's that lack of closure, but there's also the lack of closure on the responsible parties. And so it's not even though as though you can be outraged and be exhausted by all of this, but then justice is served. Everything just keeps turning. Right. Right. Well, uh, like you, I don't have any answers. It is frustrating. Uh, hopefully we'll see a day when uh, some of these policy issues need to be taken care of. But like you, I, I, I just don't. It's hard for me to imagine what's going to be the thing as these breaches keep getting bigger and bigger we say to ourselves, well, this must be the one, and it doesn't ever seem to be. The question, yes, absolutely. What's going to be the thing? And also, what does justice look like? Yeah. All right. Well, I wish we had answers, but I think there, these are important conversations, and uh, I appreciate you taking part in it. Emily Wilson, thanks for joining us. Now a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Rokos. You think cybersecurity begins and ends at the office? Of course not. And since you're listening to this podcast, we know you know better. Our homes are often an extension of our workplace. More people than ever are working from home, connecting to their corporate networks through the same router that their kids or maybe their parents, too, are using to access Clash of Clans and watch Jacksepticeye on YouTube. That means it's as critical to secure home internet access as it is to lock down a company network. Rokos Core is the first home router running Suricata-based IPS, with client and server VPN for privacy and remote access, as well as parental controls. OpenVPN-based Rokos Global VPN Network allows you to access local content around the world. 
And you can manage more than one router through Roco's Cloud, too. It's a more connected, safer, and smarter life. Visit rocos.com, that's R-O-Q-O-S dot com, and save $75 during their holiday promotion. And we thank Rocos for sponsoring the CyberWire. My guest today is Colleen Huber. She's a product manager at MediaPro, a company that describes themselves as a learning services company that specializes in the area of information security, data privacy, compliance, and custom online courseware. They recently published the results of a survey of over 1,000 finance employees, their 2017 State of Privacy and Security Awareness Report. Colleen Huber joins us to share the results. Our goal was to identify and improve employee behavior across just that wide range of risk. So we asked respondents a variety of questions based on real world scenarios. And then based on those responses, we classified them into three different categories. So the three categories or three different risk profiles, meaning privacy and security risk. So those respondents who scored the lowest, um, followed by novices, and then at the top, privacy and security heroes. And those are just based on the percentage of privacy and security where behaviors that the respondent identified. And how did it break down? How many people fell into each of those categories? So those people who we classified as risks, meaning that they posed a risk to their company, 19% of those employees fell into that category, meaning something like one in five employees. And that's kind of scary. So we know that it takes just kind of one person to to put information at risk. But when we know that's more like 20% of people, that's that's really tough. Mm-hmm. Um, the novices did better. 51% of the population fit into, uh, fit into the area. And these folks had a clue on some things, but they had pretty serious gaps in other areas. So for example, let's say that I know everything there is to know about cybersecurity. You know, I change my passwords. I, I make sure that my everything is patched, but I let somebody just walk in through the front door without checking if they have a badge or if they're authorized to be there. I would probably be classified as a novice. Um, so these people in my mind are still still a real source of concern for an organization. The good news is that about 30% of employees fell into the highest category, so security heroes, which means they could usually be trusted to do the right thing, um, and and usually is the key word there. Mm-hmm. And this is the second year of our survey, and I expect that we'll do another survey next year, but it's, it's kind of hard to say what's more notable in our findings, the fact that so many people moved from novice to hero, or that the number of people classified as risk really barely changed at all. Yeah, but let's talk about that. I mean, year over year, it seems perhaps that we are headed in the right direction. Yeah, and and I'm really, really hopeful that, that we're going to continue to see general improvement in the security and privacy awareness. And I really think that speaks to the work being done by organizations all over the world and me- media and pro included. Um, but there is always more work to be done. Was there any particular area that stood out to you as really needing improvement or or attention? You know, about 24% of employees were asked a hypothetical question about, you know, controlling access to their organization's property, to their building. So 20% of those respondents said that they would hold their office door open for someone who asked to enter, even though they didn't have maybe the proper identification or they, they were just nice enough, right? So this is the classic tailgating story. Um, Based on last year's finding, the general public seems to actually have gotten worse at recognizing these kind of security threats. So last year, only about 19% of respondents let the same person through the door. Hmm. And it's interesting to me because we spend so much time talking about phishing and information risk, but keeping the bad guys outside the building is still a a pretty big issue. Yeah, it's it's notable, I think, also, because it's uh, it's not so much a technological solution as it is just human nature. Right. It's a culture thing. It's like, how do you create a culture in your company where it's okay to stop people from coming in the front door when people want to be polite to each other? So that act of asking people to check in with security or to, to show their badge can feel awkward. Um, and yet, really, really big companies do that culture piece of it really well. Hmm. So we know it's possible. It's just a matter of building that culture 
into the organization where it's okay to stop and ask or to stop and ask to see a badge. So was there anything from the results of this survey that you found particularly surprising? I found it really interesting that we know that phishing is this hot button issue um, and study study shows that phishing is the primary cause of data breaches and malware infections. So in our survey, when respondents were presented with, I think, four emails, they were asked to identify them as fishy or legitimate. Only about 8% of employees proved to be a risk. And that's actually, you know, really decent compared to all of the other categories. There's also some real improvement from last year when it comes to, to identifying email phishing. Uh, So 92% of respondents correctly identified an example with a suspicious attachment. Um, So 92% this year, 75% last year. What I find so surprising about it, and I want to be optimistic about this phishing number because it's the best kind of single risk number in our whole survey. And yet if just one email with a malicious payload gets through, the the company's toast, right? right? I mean, let's just take our 8% number and say that, you know, a company with 5,000 employees, each of these employees gets just 10 phishing emails a year. And that's 10 that slip through both the technical defenses that, you know, IT has already put in place. So 10 emails for every 5,000 employees, that's 50,000 emails. And if the fail to recognize rate is only at, what did I say, 8%, that's still 4,000 potentially dangerous attachments that get downloaded or those links get clicked. So it's an area where I still think most companies are going to want to spend a lot of effort, even though the numbers are improving. That's Colleen Huber from MediaPro. You can check out the complete survey, the 2017 State of Privacy and Security Awareness Report, on their website. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can help protect you using artificial intelligence, visit Silance.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our show is produced by Pratt Street Media. Our editor is John Petrick. Social media editor is Jennifer Iben. Technical editor is Chris Russell, executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.